questions. So in welcoming our first speaker today, I'd just like to um, acknowledge him as uh, a very prominent author, advocate, and maybe some of you don't know this, but someone who commissions music, so we're very thankful to, to him in that respect as well. Of course, he has been a QC for many, many years, since the 70s, and has represented people as diverse as Unions and Rose Porteous and my old friend Mary Kostakidis. So will you please welcome to the stage as our first speaker today, Julian William Kennedy Burnside. Thanks, Anton. Um, most people understand intuitively the importance of language. Um, the ideal of language, of course, is to convey ideas, uh, one would hope, accurately. But some people betray that ideal, and they may betray that ideal for various reasons. Um, tact is a kindness, but it is a, um, hiding the meaning that you have in mind. Euphemism is coy and ultimately pointless. Diplomacy is just tact lifted to an international level. Doublespeak is another misuse of language, uh, far more insidious than the others. Uh, doublespeak is used as a stalking horse for conveying ideas that the speaker is not willing to acknowledge openly. Um, there are many, many instances of the use of doublespeak in our history. But a recent one, interestingly, was at the, at the um, uh, first of the trials of the major war criminals at Nuremberg in 1946. Robert Jackson, the prosecutor for the Americans, in, close, in his closing address before the tribunal at Nuremberg, said this. Uh, Nor is the lie direct the only means of falsehood. They, the defendants, all speak with a Nazi double talk with which to deceive the unwary. In the Nazi dictionary of sardonic euphemisms, final solution of the Jewish problem was a phrase which meant extermination. Special treatment of prisoners of war meant killing. Protective custody meant concentration camp. Duty labour meant slave labour. And in order to take a firm attitude or take positive measures meant to act with unrestrained savagery. Before we accept their word of what seems to be its face, we must always look for hidden meanings. And he concluded, this is slightly off the topic, but it's a brilliant closing. He concluded by saying this was the philosophy of the National Socialists, when for years they've deceived the world and masked falsehood with plausibilities. Can anyone be surprised that they continue the habits of a lifetime in this dock? It is against such a background that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they're not guilty of planning, executing or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as bloodstained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow as they beg of you, say I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. Now, we should have learned something from what had happened during the Nazi years uh, and the way uh, awful things had been disguised behind soft language. But we didn't learn. Remember, during the years of the Vietnam War, um, there was a number of bits of doublespeak that were used to somehow soften the response of the uh, Western world to what was going on. Collateral damage, now a famous expression, was invented then, and it meant killing innocent civilians. Removal with extreme prejudice meant assassination. Energetic disassembly was a bit of doublespeak for an atomic explosion. Limited duration protective reaction airstrikes meant bombing villages. An incontinent ordnance meant bombs that fell on hospitals or schools or churches instead of falling on their intended targets. An active defence was doublespeak for invasion. And I wonder how many people recognise the expression that was used some years later. Um, the, the expression was fraternal interventionist assistance. It's the way the Russians explained their invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. If you didn't know that it was reference to a hostile invasion, you would be completely misled about what they were discussing. Now, doublespeak, doublespeak has this vice. It smuggles dangerous and uncomfortable ideas 
into complacent minds. That is its purpose. And we all owe ourselves and society a duty to be on the lookout for doublespeak. Now, as some of you know, uh, I am particularly concerned about the way in which refugees are treated in this country. And I have wondered for years how it is that a country of basically decent people have tolerated the appalling misuse uh, and mistreatment of innocent human beings. And doublespeak is the answer. In 2001, when the Tampa episode uh, happened, um, the then government referred to asylum seekers as illegals. It was a false tag because they commit no offence whatever by running for safety and arriving in any country they can get to without papers. They were called queue jumpers, although there's no queue. They were described in the press as being an invasion. Um, uh, interesting, no one drew attention to the fact then or since that if that was an invasion with 438 people from Afghanistan rescued by a ship and seeking to be put ashore in Australia, obviously no one remembered the fact that the largest number of unauthorised boats to arrive in this country with the largest number of people to arrive in this country on a single day arrived on the 26th of January 1788. Um, what had been previously called border control became border protection, carrying the necessary implication that these people were a threat to us and our way of life. Later on that year, uh, there was an episode which was described as children overboard, which turned out to be a lie because no children had been thrown overboard. But the press ran with these things and magnified the false statements that the government was making because each of the statements was untrue. And at the end of that year, uh, famously, the election was run on a, a tag which was, we will decide who comes to this country in the circumstance in which they come. Which was accurate enough if they were talking about voluntary migration and utterly false if you were talking about refugee movement. And it's not only politicians who do these things, and it's not only one party, by the way, that does these things, because never has the other major political party in Australia contradicted any of the doublespeak. Um, bureaucrats are also greatly given to the misuse of language in order to disguise uncomfortable facts. I was at a public meeting uh, in South Australia in, I think, about 2003, shortly before the new high-tech Baxter Detention Centre was to be opened. And as luck would have it, uh, the ground plan of Baxter f uh, fell off the back of a truck and floated gently onto my desk. And I was interested to look at some of the details because uh, um, this is an enormous facility and it happened that I was to be speaking on a panel alongside uh, a very senior bureaucrat from the Department of Immigration. And in front of the audience, I asked this person why it was that the electric fence which surrounded the entire compound at Baxter was described on the plan as a courtesy fence. It did not seem to me very courteous to electrocute people. This uh, senior, very senior uh, bureaucrat looked at me coldly and said, it's not an electric fence, it's an energised fence. <laughs> um, I think that's probably the best bit of ad-lib doublespeak I've ever heard. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, in the months before the election in 2004, the then Prime Minister gave a speech in Adelaide in which he described Australia as a fair and decent country. I agree with that sentiment. What is interesting, though, is that just a few weeks later, his government received judgment from the High Court of Australia in a case involving a man who had come to Australia seeking asylum um, he had been refused a, uh, a protection visa in the first instance and found it so oppressive and appalling being in indefinite detention that he asked to be removed from Australia. He said he would sign any necessary piece of paper as long as they could simply get him out of the country. There was a problem though because he was stateless and so there was no country to which he could be sent. And there was an impasse because the Migration Act then and now says that a person who is not a citizen, they are called non-citizens, um, non-citizens who do not hold a visa must be held in detention until they get a visa 
or until they're removed from Australia. And here, both of those doors were closed to him. The government, whose leader had just described Australia as a fair and decent country, had argued all the way to the High Court that that man, innocent of any offence, not suspected of being a risk to anyone, could remain in detention for the rest of his life. And by a majority of four to three, the High Court of Australia held that that is what the Migration Act meant, and with that meaning, it is constitutionally valid. There is not a measure of a fair and decent society. Interestingly, um, uh, later on, the election was um, conducted, but I want you to imagine what difference it might have made if the language which had been used about asylum seekers had been changed. Imagine for a moment what might have happened if in the lead-up to the election in 2004, after having described Australia as a fair and decent society, if the Prime Minister and perhaps the Leader of the Opposition had said, we admit that no asylum seekers threw their children overboard. We admit that we lock up innocent people and drive them to self-harm, suicide and madness. We admit that we have argued for the power to lock up innocent people for the rest of their lives. We admit that we mistreat people who've done nothing worse than come here asking us, asking for our protection from their enemies. And we admit that we do that for the specific purpose of making sure that other people do not come to this country asking for our help. I think that if that had been said, the result politically might have been very different and the result socially would have been very different. Because if the public of Australia understood the indecency with which innocent human beings are treated in this country, I think that they might take a different view about policies of that sort. In the last election, we had a, an interesting, um, interesting phenomenon of the soon-to-be immigration minister again describing boat people as illegal suggesting that if any of them were to be accommodated in the community, the police should be notified, that they shouldn't be accommodated in the community near vulnerable people or near children. Um, all of those things were calculated to suggest to the public at large these are dangerous criminals from whom we need to be protected. The Department of Immigration, which used to be the Department of Immigration and Indigenous and Multicultural Affairs and then later the Department of Immigration and Citizenship, has just recently been, been renamed the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. Border Protection, not Border Control. Uh, all of these dehumanising observations about asylum seekers resulted in an election campaign which is unprecedented in Australia's modern political history. Both major parties campaigned before the October election on promising to outdo each other in the cruelty with which they could treat asylum seekers. It has never before been the case in Australia that you could get votes by promising to mistreat other human beings. And so, how is it that a good society made up of decent people has managed to turn itself to become dedicated to the idea that cruelty and mistreatment of a frightened group of human beings will win electoral popularity. If they had promised the same sort of cruelty to animals in the live export trade or to animals of any sort, they would have been hounded out of office. But we have so misused language and been so deceived by misuse of language that we now think that it's a vote winner to promise to mistreat asylum seekers. Thank you. So, Julian, you live in the world of the law where there are very strict protocols and conventions and so on. Um, do you think in, in dealing with this situation and the way it's changing that we as a, as a society need to put some of that diplomacy aside? Do we need to be more confrontational? Um, I, <laughs> yes, I think it would be quite good in a representative democracy for us to be fairly blunt with our politicians. But before we, can be, before we can expect people to be blunt with our politicians, the public at large need to be told the truth. You know, if you, if you assume for a moment that boat people 
are dangerous criminals, then of course it makes sense to protect us from them. And it's not surprising that people respond well to the idea of being protected from a threat. But it's only got to that position because politicians have either lied to us or allowed the lie to go uncontradicted. Now, you know, I know these things aren't meant to be political. The fact is that the coalition has been the liar. They have constantly um, misled the public about uh, the asylum seeker issue. But the Labor Party have never contradicted it. The Labor Party, neither in opposition nor in government, have taken the opportunity to say, all of that's wrong. They haven't broken the law. They're innocent people. Almost all of them are genuine refugees, lawfully entitled to our protection. None of that's been said. And so most of the community, about 70%, still believe that boat people are illegal, that they're criminals from whom we need to be protected. Now, um, my old friend, Professor Andrew Marcus from um, Monash University, does quite a lot of social research, including in this area. And he, he said to me once that there's a very firm tranche of Australian public opinion that is against boat people, that we don't like people arriving here on boats. Why do you think that is? Why is it particularly about boat arrivals? We don't seem to have the same attitude towards plane mm. arrivals asking for asylum. Mm. And, and the number who arrive by plane and ask for asylum is far greater than the number who arrive by boat. And there's an interesting fact about that. Um, among boat arrivals, roughly, over the last 15 years, roughly 90% of them have ultimately been assessed as refugees entitled to protection. Of aeroplane arrivals, who are more numerous, none of them are put in detention, and ultimately about 20% of them are ass assessed as being refugees entitled to protection. Um, the reason for the difference, of course, is the pragmatic one, that the boat journey from Indonesia to here is very dangerous. People die on the way, and it's a mark of sincerity that you take that risk. Um, I, I would have thought, you know, if you want to demonise any group, maybe demonise the ones who come here as tyre kickers who aren't actually refugees at all, but who think they'll give it a go. I don't agree in demonising anyone. Let me make that very clear. <laughs> but as a society, we have really singled out the wrong group. We've really singled out the ones who most deserve our sympathy. And the greatest irony of all is, over the last 15 years, most boat people have been escaping our enemies. And the old principle says, my enemy's enemy is probably my friend. Just want to get your comment on this, Julian, about how this debate seems to have shifted. Initially, the whole asylum seeker thing was about smashing the people smugglers business model. Actually, that was the second phase. Was it? The first phase was simply demonise them, flat out say, you know, these are awful people, they threw their children in the, uh, overboard, you know, they're criminals, queue jumpers, etc. That was the first phase. Um, that began to look a bit indecent as human stories about boat people began to get out. And so um, the second round of it, which was in uh, about 2008, um, the attack was on people smugglers, vilest, you know, scum of the earth, all of those things. There's an interesting thing about people smugglers. It may be that they're not all ornaments to human society, but they do provide a service which, which boat people want. It's not, it's not um, a supply-driven operation, it's a demand-driven operation. Um, the other thing about um, um, people smugglers is, is that you can't lump them all together in the same moral basket. Uh, it's worth remembering that Kevin Rudd's moral hero, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a people smuggler. It's worth remembering that Oscar Schindler, who we rather admired when we read the book or saw the film, Oscar Schindler was a people smuggler. Um, it's worth remembering Gustav Schroeder, who was the captain of the uh, St. Louis, a ship that departed Hamburg in May of 1939 with 900 Jews on board. He took them uh, wherever he could to try and get them to a place of safety. He ended up at Cuba and had to turn back. He was held off the Florida coast at gunpoint. He ended up taking them back to Europe and putting them ashore in Antwerp, and a few months later, when the Low Countries were overrun, uh, more than half of them were taken into uh, concentration camps and were killed. Now, Gustav Schroeder did every dodgy thing in the book to try and save those 900 Jews. He failed. He did it for the money. He was a people smuggler. Then he was seen as a hero. Now he's seen as a hero. 
To say that he's the vilest person on earth would be a travesty. And by the way, for people um, with, with artistic inclinations, um, there was a time when one of the most popular musicals around was The Sound of Music. In The Sound of Music, the Von Trapp family are refugees and the, and the nuns were people smugglers. Mm. <laughs> And in fact, my colleague, uh, Les Murray, today one of the most prominent Australians, uh, he escaped Hungary by means of using people smugglers who they mm. had to pay to get out. He wouldn't be here today without that. And just one other note I wanted to say, um, there's a book called The People Smuggler, mm. written by Robin de Krepp, and he was a really, really good read, really changed my mind about um, yeah. the complexity of this, uh, of this subject. So Exactly right, and that, that's about a guy called Ali al Janabi who fled... Um, Saddam Hussein's reg regime and yeah, he was a dead set people smuggler, he was convicted of people smuggling but you can't read the book uh, and come away thinking anything but he is a decent guy doing something that was valuable to other people and doing it for good reasons you know, it, so, it will so, change your mind So in terms of where we are with this debate Julian, uh, you know, as we say it's moved on to different things, at one point there was a concern about maritime safety um, we even had people talking about queue jumpers, as you say, not just on the right, but also on the left. I heard Peter Beattie saying that during the election campaign. And now it seems to be that the emphasis is on just stopping the flow. Is mm. that where we are at the moment? That's where we are at the moment. And, of course, the third phase of the campaign against, uh, against boat people was the, oh, they drown at sea. And, oh, we actually adore refugees. We adore boat, boat people. We can't bear to see them smashed up on the rocks at Christmas Island. And, of course, every death at sea is tragic. But um, the, what we tend to overlook is that the reason people take the risk of drowning at sea is because they are seeking to escape something they perceive as a greater danger uh, back in Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq or Pakistan. Um, and... What we do tend to overlook is that if a person decides that the danger of the voyage will put them off or that the prospect of being banged up in well, Nauru or Manus Island is too awful, if they decide instead that they will stay back and face their persecutors and they are killed, they're just as dead as if they drowned. The difference is that it's not on our conscience. Why? Not, not an easy answer to that. I don't think that we should feel in any way more worthy merely because we force people to stay where they are and be killed by the Taliban than by suffering as we watch them drown in their attempt to escape. The fact is they make a calculated choice and refugee movements have always been messy and dangerous and it will always be so. Well, speaking of the, uh, the power of language, you mentioned John Howard and his famous quote at, during one of the election campaigns. Actually, I didn't mention John Howard, if you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be By very indication. apolitical. <laughs> when he launched the uh, 2004 election campaign, he said, this election is about trust, mm. which I thought was very interesting use of language. But my question actually relates to a comment he made very recently about climate change, where he said he only introduced proposals for an ETS because there was political... Uh, he felt the political pressure to do so, that it wasn't out of a sort of gut feeling. How does that, do you think... I'm trying to contextualise that within this debate about asylum seekers. There seems to be a market for this idea of having a hardline approach. Is it that they're, it's just because there are votes to be had? What is the, what is the motivation that that prompts politicians now on both sides to have more of this hardline approach? Um, in my view, and I'm no expert in politics, but in my view it is in order to get votes um, and uh, the people who are trying to get votes recognise that self-interest is always a pretty strong runner. And so if you describe a tax as a great big new tax, then you can, you can guarantee that people's self-interest will incline them to vote against it. Um, so instead of saying, we are trying to save the planet for the next generations. Um, if instead you... Uh, and appealing to our better nature, if instead you say it's a great big new tax, then you will swing people to make them feel that it is respectable to oppose it. Um, I think it's really fascinating seeing the debate about um, climate change and the way it's 
still contentious. Do you know even the Los Angeles Times is no longer willing to publish letters which question the reality of climate change. That's a pretty striking thing. Um, and you know, America's not f far behind us, I think, in our willingness to question the, the thing. But it's interesting that very, very few of the denialists, in fact, none of the denialists, are prepared to look at the precautionary principle. We have on the you know, observable facts, we have 97% of the world's scientists all in agreement about the fact that climate change is real, dangerous, seriously dangerous, and, uh, and at least in significant part contributed to by mankind, which is important because that means that we can change course and ameliorate it. Now, of course, it's possible. Someone said, you know, scientific questions aren't decided by majority vote, and that's true. It's possible that all of those scientists are wrong. So the question then is, what are the odds that they're all wrong? And if you say, well, I'll, I'll, give, it, I'll give it four out of five chances that they're wrong, only a one in five chance that they're right. That's, I mean, that's, that would be astounding odds. Uh, you won't get that from any of the bookmakers. But let's suppose you said, I reckon there's only a one chance in five that the climate scientists are right in what they're saying. That's better odds than Russian roulette. Russian roulette gives you a one in six chance of copping a bullet. The, the, this approach will give you a one in five chance of copping a bullet. And if the answer to that is, oh, well, hang on, it's not going to kill us all, um, it's only going to hurt us, OK, well, try playing Russian roulette with your child, having the gun aimed at her leg instead of her head. I don't think too many people go with that. And yet, this is what the precautionary principle demands. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, I haven't prepared a talk about the misuse of language <laughs> to per persuade people about climate change. That, not with 15 minutes available. You did mention this concept of complacent minds, how we sort of, you know, we go along with things. Uh, it could also be argued that we've had a democratic change of government. The program and platform policy, uh, policy platform was advertised, and now we're moving in line with what was, to mm. what was told to us. We voted for that. It could be argued that that is just what we want. Yeah, and that's the Jim Hacker approach to government. I am their leader. I must follow them. That's, I think on ethical issues in particular, leaders have an obligation to lead. And if I had to single out one key problem, the key problem in Australia at the moment, it is that we have no political leadership. None at all. To what degree do you think that the media is complicit? We, I see regularly, I'm not saying particularly on, on my channel, but... Um, <laughs> You see, regularly we use the term border protection as a generic term now, mm. when in fact it is a, a political slogan. It is. It, it's seeped into the language, and um, um, uh, it's, it's rare in the media to see a sustained rejection of the, let's call it what it is, the propaganda about asylum seekers. Um, border protection, you know, it used to be called border, border control, and it's quite interesting uh, to have a look at the figures. Every year, something like five million people enter this country, um, mostly on you know, business tourism and so on. Um, and they come with visas and they go through passport control and so on. Uh, every, uh, well, last, in the last 12 months, 25,000 boat people came to Australia. That means that border control was effective in about 99.7% of cases. I think that's pretty efficient. For any human system, 99.7% success is pretty good. Um, now, if you're calling it border protection, then you've got to say, OK, what's the threat? Is the threat that border control isn't working? Plainly not. Is the threat that these people are dangerous to us? Well, let's have a look at the facts. And the facts are, no, they're not. Um, that's, that's how language can insidiously infect the way we approach anything. And by the way, on the, on the idea that a, a government is democratically elected, if a government is democratically elected on the basis of falsehood, then I don't think that there is any justification for implementing or pursuing that falsehood. OK, does anyone from the floor want to put any questions to Julian? We have a... Um, what's, what's your ideas on community integration? Because... I'm sorry? Your, your ideas on community integration? Like, we... Uh, the government doesn't seem to um, want to do much in that, that 
that avenue. Can is there anything that we can do to kind of improve that as a community? Um, it, it depends on what you mean by community integration. Um, it, that can have two quite different meanings. One is continue with the present system, but help people integrate into the community once you release them from indefinite detention. Um, obviously, no matter what system of detention you have, I think it's essential to provide genuine help for people adjusting to uh, a new society and a different language, a different culture. And especially if you've been mistreating them for a couple of years, they're going to need a bit of spoon feeding. But you see, I, I would see community integration as operating in a very different way. Um, one of the suggestions I put up recently is that uh, in, scrap the Pacific solution, scrap indefinite detention, all of that. Um, after one month of initial detention of people who arrive without papers, initial detention for preliminary health and security checks, maximum one month. After that, release them into the community on an interim visa until their refugee status is determined. And that interim visa would have a few conditions. One, they have to stay in touch with the department so they can't simply disappear. Second, uh, they're entitled to work. Third, they're entitled to full Centrelink and Medicare benefits. And fourth, crucially, until their refugee status is determined, they have to be uh, uh, they have to live in a specified country town. Now, if every single one of them stayed on Centrelink benefits, highly unlikely, because these are very motivated people, but if every single one of them stayed on full Centrelink benefits uh, on last year's numbers, it would cost us a maximum of $500 million a year, and all of that money would be spent in the failing economies of country towns. And I tell you what, country towns are quite keen on this idea. Um, at the moment, we are spending $4 billion a year, mostly paid to overseas you know, multinational jail operators and the like, um, and, and we're causing immense damage to the people who are being treated this way. Now, uh, you know, it's a no-brainer. Save $3.5 billion and start acting the way we should act, acting decently to innocent people, um, I reckon that can do some good. But I'd add a sweetener, uh, and that is, out of the $3.5 billion a year savings, Let's spend one billion a year on public housing construction for homeless Australians. We still two, two and a half billion ahead, and everyone benefits. That would be community integration. We've only got about two minutes left. So, anybody else from the floor like to ask a question? There's a woman over there. There's a mic coming towards you. Thanks. After World War II, with new Australian arrivals, it was highly visible that we had people coming into Australia. And same with after the Vietnam War, where there was so much visibility in people arriving. Personally, I feel that there's a lot of visibility on sound bites, news footage, but there's not a lot of information at the moment about what's happening or the number of refugees, their status, their needs coming into Australia. I'm wondering from, again, a community point of view, what can, either what can we do or what do you think would be viable in increasing an awareness and a visibility of refugees in our community to work towards integration? Because it seems that it's 20-second news feature with the same Christmas Island footage, but mm. that's, that's not something that we can connect to, as Anton said, the personal narrative. We can't connect to that as a community. So I'm just curious about increasing okay. Okay. what um, we see. Uh, um, uh, in a country where we have no political leader who will stand up and tell the truth, um, persuade all your friends to watch SBS, uh, <laughs> persuade them to stop reading Murdoch newspapers, um, Use social media to get the facts out. Speak to friends and have them speak to their friends and so on. Um, getting the facts out is crucial. You know, initially, when I first became uh, engaged in this subject, uh, I was actually very pessimistic about the Australian character. I thought that we were just behaving badly, all of us. But I'm now persuaded that most Australians are actually really decent people and that the government is betraying that decency by misleading people into, into approving action which is indecent. Um, persuading them to approve it by lying to them about these people being 
criminals and so on. So I, I think the solution to that, in order to get the country back to being the way it really is, uh, is to get the facts out there. And that's hard. You've just got to use every communication device you've got to get the facts out there. Because I suspect that if, if that's why I said, you know, imagine if in the run-up to any election, one senior politician had told the truth about what's going on, do you really think Australia would continue to support this policy? I really don't think... I know some would. I know some would. Some people are still against immigration, um, and even though we've, we've built almost all of our wealth uh, on immigration, um, especially the post-war immigration that you mentioned. Uh, I think you really need to get the facts out and then rely on the decency of Australians at large. And I... I if, if there is one thing that really distresses me about what we've seen in the last 15 years, it is that successive Australian governments have betrayed the true character of this nation. This nation's character is being redefined as, as we speak. Um, we still regard ourselves as friendly, warm, generous, open people. Overseas, go travelling overseas and people will tell you we are seen as selfish, greedy and cruel. It's not the Australia that any of us want. Jordan says we can have a few more minutes, so we can take one more, one or two more questions. Julian, uh, can you hear me? Well, yeah, can't see you, that's all. <laughs> Julian, I, I think, uh, well, first I'd like to thank you for your contribution this morning and taking the time out to do that. Um, I think there's a lot of validity in what you've had to say. Uh, as a QC, I wonder, though, if you could put your hand on your heart and say that you don't use doublespeak. I do not use doublespeak. <laughs> In the defence of your clients, you don't use doublespeak? No. Thank you. No. Apart from anything else, judges are generally quite good bullshit detectors. <laughs> and, and it's best to find the real points that support your case instead of trying to mislead a judge who's probably smarter and on the lookout for that sort of thing. Um, um, and luckily, I'm almost always acting for the good guys. <laughs> um, Julian, thanks again for your uh, ongoing advocacy for refugees. And uh, I'd just like to ask you to comment on the notion that um, following the uh, sort of manipulation through use of language and then control of media and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, changes to policy and laws, could you briefly comment on um, the proposed change to the uh, uh, racial um, vilification laws and, and perhaps within the context of to what extent does that also suggest that Australian society are being duped in terms of how uh, xenophobic and racialized attitudes are from our current government. Yeah. Um, Thanks. <clears throat> it's quite a big subject. Um, I think specifically you're referring to the proposal to um, repeal Section 18, Capital C of the Racial uh, Vilification Act. That was the section which was used against Andrew Bolt in the Etoc and Bolt litigation. Um, personally, I think 18C is more widely drawn than it needs to be. Uh, those plaintiffs could very easily have succeeded in a defamation action that would not have needed the Racial Vilification Act at all. Um, I, I, I think it is sensible to have, litigate, uh, to have legislation which uh, prohibits hate speech of various sorts. But I think the criteria for what constitutes hate speech should be something that will cause uh, um, uh, or is likely to cause uh, adverse action or violence against the person who's the subject of hate speech. Short of that, um, you've got a balancing act between the interests of free speech on the one hand and the operation of the defamation laws on the other hand. And I, don't th I, I do think 18C goes a bit too far. So I'm, that's probably not the answer you're expecting to hear, but that's my opinion. OK, I think we are now out of time. We've uh, stolen some time from our next speaker. So will you please join me in thanking Julian Burnside? Thank you.